to take it the other way because it's too bright out there. short. No, but can you sit down? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it Puya, my name is Puya. Sure. Mm -hmm. So my name is Puya Jamshidi, and I'm a second year medical student here at UCSC. Uh, I participated last summer through the M-Stream program, and I um, did a neuro-oncology research. Sure. Um, first, let me explain a little bit what the problem was that I was focusing on. Glioblastoma multiforme is the most common, most aggressive form of uh, tumor of the central nervous system. The median survival without any treatment is only three months. With very aggressive um, treatment regimen, which includes surgical re um, resection, I'm going to redo this. Um, we, okay. <laughs> With treatment, um, which includes surgical resection, very aggressive um, concurrent adjuvant chemotherapy and radio radiation, still the median survival is only 14 months. So there are three factors that to date have been identified that contributes to and influences the patient survival. One is the age of the patients during the diagnosis, 
two, it's what is called Karnofsky performance status, which is basically an overall well-being of the patient. And three is the extent of uh, surgical retention. Surgical resection. <laughs> Should I do all three or? Just three. Okay. Three is the extent of surgical re resection. So my um, project basically focused on how we can improve the extent of surgical re resection in a way to make it as precise and um, less minimally invasive as possible. The way we approach this is basically um, looking to see the biology of the tumor cells and how we can manipulate that biology to basically enhance the visualization of the brain tumors. Because visualization of glioblastoma in the brain is extremely hard and it's one of the biggest challenges in making the resection a safe approach. The way we went about it is uh, basically uh, through a uh, collaboration with Dr. Roger Chen, uh, a Nobel laureate here at UCSD, um, we uh, developed this collaboration that they had a fluorescent probe and um, we identified through bioinformatics analysis that certain uh, proteins called matrix metal proteases are overexpressed on the surface of tumor cells when it comes to glioblastoma multiforme. And these um, fluorescent probe, basically, we use it. And the beauty of this fluorescent probe is that it would only be uh, fluorescent when it's cleaved by those uh, proteins, the metalloproteases that I mentioned. And because they are highly overexpressed in the tumor cells, um, we basically have the advantage of making sure that only tumor cells are fluorescent. And that would make a big difference when a neurosurgeon goes in the OR and um, by the time they open the skull and they have the brain exposed, they can actually look at the tissue and see where it's fluorescent. And it makes it a lot safer and it, um, it ensures that the neurosurgeon basically takes out all the cells that are fluorescent, indicating that they have the biology of a tumor cell. Sure. Um, I've been very fortunate here that um, when I proposed this project to Dr. Clark Chen, who's a neurosurgeon himself and the co-director of Center for Theoretical and Applied uh, Neuro-Oncology, he was very receptive and he was very uh, supportive of this idea. Um, again, it's a big uh, collaboration with a Nobel laureate and um, he actually made it happen that we developed this collaboration. Um, since then, I've really enjoyed the collaboration, and I would actually like to take this um, opportunity and also thank Dr. Roger Chen, Dr. Nguyen, um, who's also one of the participants in this project. And um, I've also really benefited from the mentorship of Dr. Carter, who's the Chief of Division of Neurosurgery here at UCSD. This one is actually, I'm preparing the publication for it. I can talk about that I'm in the process of um, preparing a manuscript, sure. So this um, collaboration has actually um, has been very fruitful and now I'm in the process of um, putting together a manuscript that we hope to send it to a neurosurgery journal where it can actually um, encourage the field to use this approach in their um, surgical resections. Okay. Sure. I'm, I'm very interested in academic setting. I, I envision one day to um, be an academic physician and um, currently I'm very interested in neurosurgery. Um, as a second year medical student, I'm trying to expose myself to as many fields as possible um, to ensure that I make the right decision when it comes um, down to the decision. But I, what, one thing I know is I want to stay in academia and continue doing rigorous research and hoping that um, we can improve the field.
Yeah, I was an assistant conductor of Tehran Philharmonic. Yeah, I, so before um, doing any kind of science, I was trained as a musician. And I remember I got goosebumps every time I listened to music. And when I started reading about the brain and the complexities of the brain, um, I got the similar goosebumps. And I knew that by then, this is what I am really interested in. Um, and that's what really what I like about research is it really the creativity that exists in research. It allows you to come up with innovative ways of approaching um, disease states. Okay. I don't know, Johnny, are you okay being filmed? You can say no. It's from the NIH, the M stream program. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Can you just film your hands? Can we get your hand? No. Uh, that's fine if you do it. Yeah, it's fine. It's blurry. Okay. So, you get Uh, my name is Catherine Dufour, and I'm a second year medical student at uh, UCSD Medical School. And can you tell us about the uh, thesis project that you were uh, So, the summer after my first year, I worked with MStream and I did a summer project at the HIV Neurobehavioral Research Center in San Diego. Um, so, one of one problem that's occurring with those with HIV is that now that we have better treatments, patients are sorry, actually, okay, yeah, sorry. Okay. So what's the problem with HIV? Um, so now that we've come up with kind of combination antiretroviral therapies, patients are actually living longer with HIV, and so they're experiencing more of the kind of comorbidities and difficulties that come, can come along with aging. Um, Particularly, neurocognitive impairment is still highly seen in that population. Despite treatment, the prevalence of kind of the milder forms is actually in, has increased a little bit. No, it's okay. <laughs> I 
I'd rather do no, multiple. Like, you know, like that in yeah, the video. not good. Yeah. Not a good angle. So, oh, and is it supposed to be like that? Oh. Oh, thank you. Is that? Uh, my name is Catherine Dufour, and I'm a second year medical student at the University of California at San Diego. Can you say how many of you are at Yes, so the summer after my first year, I participated in MStream, and I worked with Dr. David Moore at the HIV Neurobehavioral Research Center in San Diego. And we looked at uh, aging in HIV because since we've come up with combination antiretroviral therapies, uh, a lot more people are now aging with HIV, and that comes with a kind of different host of comorbidities and kind of difficulties that they can experience. And particularly, um, the HNRC focuses a lot on neurocognitive impairment because um, mild neurocognitive impairment is still highly prevalent. Like around 50% of those infected with HIV will experience at least some form of uh, cognitive impairment. So we were kind of looking for what is, since the, the drugs, the therapy doesn't really seem to be a solution, what kind of lifestyle factors can we look into? So. Uh, the project that I did was looking at uh, exercise participation and neurocognitive impairment. So they had previously, um, they have really large cohorts. So it was, it was nice for me because I had a lot of data to work with without having to collect it myself. Um, so they had collected some uh, exercise questions asking participants how often did they spend time in kind of a, a heart rate um, increasing activity in the last 6, 24, and 72 hours. So I kind of worked with that questionnaire in um, characterizing people as those who have exercised in the last 72 hours and those who didn't really exercise in the last 72 hours and comparing the, the neurocognitive impairment rates. Uh, so we found that those who um, confirmed or uh, reported that they had exercised in the last 72 hours had about uh, twice as less or half as much <laughs> um, neurocognitive impairment as those who hadn't reported exercise. And that remained significant even controlling for the age, the HIV disease characteristics, um, psychiatric characteristics such as depression or drug abuse. So it was, it was good. <laughs> Um, well, we did a cross-sectional study, so we can't infer that it's causational, but um, looking at exercise and HIV is actually a very new um, kind of topic. It's been proven that it's, it's beneficial, but the cognitive impact of it hasn't really been looked at before, so this is kind of a kind of first step in that, that research. So we, th we think what it's saying is that if you exercise, uh, consistently or if you exercise it'll help improve your cognition and prevent some of the the cognitive decline um, but a for a future study would have to really prove that so do you have any recommendations as to like how many what type of exercise or like how many hours is you know better or um, what's enough Mm -hmm. Well, our measure was a little bit limited because it was only if you would spend any time in uh, the last 72 hours. But it looks like um, I'm now working on a, another paper or another project with Dr. Moore on longitudinal um, exercise. So we, 
now followed patients through multiple visits and it looks like the people who receive the best benefit are ones who exer reported exercise at every visit. So I think just doing a few hours a week and consistently doing it over many years is probably the, be the most beneficial. Uh, my paper was published in the Journal of Neural Biology. And um, it was quoted in the media. Can you that? Yeah, so I, it was selected for a press release, and so it ended up getting picked up by a lot of um, HIV infection organizations and also like the Huffington Post and um, USA News. Um, and they, they really pushed it as, you know, exercise benefits, cognition in those with HIV. So that was really exciting because it's a project where if somebody with HIV reads that, they can change maybe their outcome and improve their, their quality of life. Yeah, I definitely, Mstream helped a lot. Um, first off, they matched me actually with my mentor and uh, Dr. Moore and the HNRC, and I'm really grateful for that because uh, not only is Dr. Moore and also I worked with a postdoc, Dr. Marchini, are excellent mentors, but the HNRC is just a interesting place where it's really, they have neuropsych, neuromed, you have a whole statistics department. There's a lot of support um, every step of the way. And so I'm most grateful for that. And then additionally, just the financial support, being a med student, um, it makes it a lot easier to spend time doing research when you're not worrying about paying rent or, or where your next meal is coming from. And then also I've gotten support to present my um, abstracts or posters at different conferences. Um, so that's been really amazing. Um, what conferences did you present? Uh, so Last year I presented at the International Neuro uh, Behavioral Society annual meeting and it was in um, Kona, Hawaii, so that was really fun and educational. <laughs> and then this year I'm hoping to go to HIV and aging workshop and then again to the INS. And are you doing a research elective for Um, no. No, I, I, I mean, I don't think this should be in the video, but I took a year off, uh, more for personal reasons, but, oh, yeah. So, no, I just want to know, I just, because it kind of sounds like you, you still work with Dr. Moore, so I was thinking, is it a part of us, you want to just, you know, stay with this lab? Um, so I took, I took a, I worked with Dr. Moore one summer, and then I took the year off, and I still worked with him, uh -huh. and then I also participated in M-Stream last summer, so I just did two summers with them. Yeah, but then they supported me the whole year with paying for conferences and um, that kind of thing. Um, so what are your further plans you're making the next couple of years? My next, uh, past med school. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure. I'm, I don't know. Um, I am maybe thinking about doing like a one of the clinical research master's degrees, but I'm not sure. And I'm also interested in now working with patients with HIV, so I'm thinking about maybe going into infectious disease. And what sparked your interest in HIV and HIV? You, you know, before you started M-Stream, what sparked your interest in that? Um, not really. <laughs> Really what happened is um, when they were picking uh, which mentor I work with, they kind of asked me some of my interests and I had just said HIV and um, they just kind of matched me to Dr. Moore. So I didn't really, before working I, with him, I didn't really realize that HIV and aging was such a big thing because that's really kind of the next direction of the disease because it's not quite as an acute kind of sudden life-ending disease. So how would you describe Dr. Moore as a mentor? Because we really value him really high. He's a, he's a really good mentor. Oh, okay. We don't have, like, um, can you talk? Oh, 
Um, working with Dr. Moore was um, a very good experience. He is amazing on many levels. He's very passionate and interested about teaching. He's very generous. He's very good at giving students and those who work with him the credit that they deserve. I mean, it's easy. He let me be first author on the paper and several other papers like, where maybe other PIs wouldn't be as interested in letting you do that. And on top of everything, I also appreciated all the professional advice he gave me, like going through my PowerPoints and editing them and teaching me how to be a better presenter. Um, kind of like those life skills that maybe most, most people wouldn't stop to, to help you with. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys. You made this easy.